Well, thanks for having me. Um, appreciate the compliment on the last talk, given that it was totally off the cuff, uh, unprepared. And uh, basically what happened was we were supposed to do an on-site visit in September, and it snowed two feet the night before, and uh, not a lot to see on the project. So we ended up at the soup shack uh, picturing things as I, best I could describe them for folks. So uh, as Robert said, my name is Matt Barnes. Um, I'm a professional engineer with Morrison Merrily in our natural resources group. And um, today we're talking about the French Gulch and Moose Creek project. That's a project I've been involved in since 2013, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, if there are any topics or questions as I go through it, I'd welcome questions to not have to listen to myself talk the whole time and also you know, speak to some topics that folks might be more interested in. Um, so like I said, it's been going on since 2013. Just this past uh, December, we finished up our final report on the project after some monitoring and uh, some work that was done this past year. And here's some of the reasons why the project got completed and I'll expand upon those as we go through. So, as Robert mentioned, uh, we were contracted directly with the Big Hole Watershed Committee, but uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks certainly played an extremely large role in the project. It was located on the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area. That's their land ownership, so they're the management agency for that entire watershed, more or less. And uh, Jim Olson, the fisheries biologist for the Big Hole, was a um, really the mastermind and, and from inception to completion, uh, the primary person on the project. Um, and we did utilize some other engineering firms through personal connections and bringing in their expertise, uh, particularly in uh, wetlands and some of the uh, revegetation aspects. And then I also did want to just mention, um, you know, let put recognition out there for the construction contractors that built the project and were uh, really great to work with throughout. Montana civil contractors out of Belgrade, some other folks uh, in Anaconda and Missoula. Pioneer Technical Services was involved in the inceptional uh, phases of the project to look for um, potential heavy metals and things of that nature. And, and some NGOs, uh, Montana Conservation Corps, did some habitat work too. So really a broad spectrum of folks worked on this project to make it happen. So the talk today, um, just kind of running from cradle to grave, project inception, field work, preliminary design, grant funding, construction process, post-project monitoring, how that led to some enhancements, and then kind of transitioning from rear view mirror to looking at the windshield for future monitoring and what's next for the Mount Hagen area. So the Mount Hagen is more or less this valley in the, on the Big Hole side. Um, of the Continental Divide. French Creek flows down into the big hole here. French Gulch is kind of the terminology that's been adopted for the project area that, that we're focused on here. Uh, Moose Creek is a, is a small portion of that. And, and one thing to note is uh, the Anaconda smelter impacts are fairly evident and they really weren't identified as part of this project and that really becomes important from a funding standpoint for natural resource damage program funds. And so just to note that they were aware and, and supportive of the project, but they had their own kind of projects they were uh, putting funds towards. So um, not a heavy involvement from that or agency on this project. So when we zoom in to French Gulch, this is French Gulch. These are the three primary reaches that were identified for restoration and where the restoration got completed in 2016 and 2017. And then Moose Creek here is uh, the restoration really only occurred on a smaller reach of that a, a, to a lesser degree. Similar implementation schemes and, and designs, just a, a smaller footprint. And another thing that I often like to note is it's all public land, so if anyone's curiosity has peaked, you can go out there and look at it. I mean, not right now, maybe, unless you have a snowmobile, but um, as soon as it melts, uh, there's a lot of dispersed camping along the French Creek Road, um, Moose Creek Road as well. Um, there were people hunting and fishing while we were doing work, um, so a lot of folks out there utilizing this land. <laughs> so why the project and why French Gulch? Placer and dredge mining, to be brief. Um, early, or early 1900s, late 1800s, um, French Gulch and Moose Creek were heavily mined for 
um, silver, gold, I'm sure other minerals. Um, this project, the terminus, upstream terminus of it is basically right there. We're able to locate this photo just from visual matching. And uh, as you can see, these valleys were basically turned upside down from dredges, similar to if you go up towards Alder or Virginia City. Um, it had grown over, of course, you know, with conifer encroachment and some riparian vegetation, but as far as the topography, what these dredges left was what was there uh, before the project got implemented. Was that hydraulically mined also? There were some aspects, not to a large scale, not nearly as large as um, the dredges, but, but yeah, the, it does look like there were some spot hydraulic mining efforts, particularly up above the project that we completed. So here's a drone image of just before construction began in 2016. This is the lower reach of French Gulch. As you can see, the dredge piles are still pretty much right where they were when the dredges turned off. French Creek ran just straight as an arrow right down that uh, dredge pile. And as you can see, I mean, the, the riparian vegetation had established right along that very narrow corridor. But as I'll describe, when you look at the uh, fluvial context, uh, the pattern of the stream, the profile, habitat complexity, it just wasn't there. And so, so from, you know, just a, a quick look at a, a zoomed in view, if you're standing on the stream, it wasn't apparent that it was uh, degraded, but then when you looked at, at a valley landscape scale, it became very obvious that there was uh, some impairments. And another thing to note that I'll dive into a little bit as we go through is um, Highway 569, Mill Creek Road, that runs from Anaconda towards Wise River has been relocated in Lower French Creek, so it, you can kind of say actually that's the old alignment there through basically bisecting the main French Creek corridor. That's been relocated on an upland bench, so it's opened up more opportunity for restoration going forward in lower French Creek reaches. And um, this crossing right, well you can see it right there maybe, um, I'll describe that a little bit and how a heavy civil project like a highway was able to be interfaced with the restoration project and, and work together. And our company designed that highway as well. We've got some highway engineers that were involved in that. So project objectives, um, this is the quick high point list, um, but really everything funnels back to floodplain connection and stream function. A lot of these other objectives fall out of restoring that one up top. Um, increase spawning habitat for native trout species. Uh, if Jim were here, he could describe to you if, if, if his larger fisheries habitat and restoration goals become realized in Mount Hagen, it'll be the second largest um, native habitat restoration project in the state, second only to Cherry Creek in uh, the Madison. When you're designing that project, do you take into account that you're trying to restore West Slope cutthroat trout as opposed to brook trout and that you're allowing for the native mussel habitat that was in there? We're aware of that. I'm, I'm a civil engineer, so I'm definitely not, I, I couldn't, there, there aren't certain aspects that I would pull from. I would certainly take them from experts that would know to incorporate into our design. Um, our approach really is to find and measure natural functioning systems in the right context and try and apply those as a template here and with the assumption that those native species are adapted and, more, and that habitat's more conducive to the mussels and the west slope and the grayling and this drainage and stuff like that. So um, it's I guess a, a corollary, but it's not necessarily we're designing a, a west slope stream, so that's going to look different than a, a brook, brook, brook trout stream, so to speak, Thank if that you. makes sense. Um, but uh, Dave Stagliano, uh, one of the state's experts in pearl shell mussels, did find some pearl shells, I believe, in French Creek, right? Down lower? Down lower. Yeah. Uh, they were a, a, a very old adult population. have a relationship with the cutthroat trout, and so that symbiosis wasn't um, effective in this drainage. So um, unfortunately, he looked for them pretty hard, and um, maybe they can be restored someday, but you know, maybe what, you know, what this work with the stream restoration and hopefully restoring some of those native populations can allow 
those pro-shell muscles to uh, repopulate that drainage. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just conifer encroachment was more of a wildlife habitat um, objective from the from Vanabakadori, the wildlife manager. And since we had heavy equipment in the area, it was it made sense to to try and achieve some of those objectives too. So, so with those project objectives known, we came up with a field work program uh, that really came at it from a, bolt, a multitude of, of avenues. Um, collecting LIDAR information to map the valley and the, the larger topographic features, um, doing field work to hand measure a lot of stream substrate channel dimensions, um, classifying woody habitat or lack thereof, vegetation surveys, flow rate uh, measurements to calibrate our hydrologic analyses, a lot of survey, I, I mean I can't even, I, I should know this, but we surveyed hundreds of bathymetric cross-sections to categorize similar reaches of, of French Gulch. Um, and then just uh, field visits from various different professional disciplines, wetlands um, people, uh, fisheries biologists, cultural resource people, um, you know, the historical folks oftentimes view these mining areas as valuable and, and a cultural resource, so trying to figure out, because permitting was eventually going to need to be overcome as far as SHPO, um, how, the, how we could make that work from, you know, at times, those competing interests. Uh, so taking that information from the field and, and bringing it back to the office and analyzing it to see if we can quantify uh, and, and kind of put, bring to terms what reaches of French Gulch really do need um, to be restored, to be reconstructed, uh, and and what sections maybe need portions, at certain aspects reconstructed, and some portions don't. Some portions do serve as that template of a functioning system that we can implement in areas that do need restoration. And so, um, this is just a, a quick snapshot of of a priority one reach. That's a reach that needs uh, full reconstruction, re rebuild the channel, rebuild the floodplain, uh, heavy earth moving equipment versus a reference reach where um, we identified a reach you know, kind of like this where we've got a wide wetland corridor. We've got some lack of sinuosity, but we do have some. Um, we've got some impounded areas, some woody habitat, and, and a pool frequency that's more frequent, you know, shows that habitat complexity that we're looking for. But in particular, the pattern, the, the, the lack of channel meander was, was extremely apparent as far as departure from what we'd expect from a functioning stream like this. So with that information, we're able to come up with a preliminary design of where we're going to propose restoration. So that, this kind of ties back to one of those first slides where I showed in French Gulch there was three main reaches. The lower reach, the middle reach, which was definitely the largest, some road relocation within that reach, and then an upper reach that had some connectivity issues as far as aquatic passage through that reach uh, due to a culvert and some other factors. And then Moose Creek's not highlighted here, but it really was right about here, and, and I'll certainly touch on that a couple times, but it, it, it uses all the same aspects as French Gulch, just on a smaller scale, like I mentioned. And one other thing to note, we uh, worked with the landowner, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, to identify points where we, or areas where we could salvage materials, sod mats, willows, things like that. and. Um, that certainly saves on costs when you're doing these projects to not have to import that material from a, a distant source. So preliminary design, uh, we had existing topographic information from the LIDAR. We could lay out our new stream channel, um, floodplain extents, calculate earthwork quantities, uh, bioengineering type designs, new channel complexity and profile, and basically enough data to show funders, agencies, permit folks what we're going to do, where we're going to do it, and how much it's likely to cost. And with that information, they can go to those funding agencies, they being Big Hole Watershed Committee and um, FWP, and, and apply for the <coughs> roughly million dollars it would take to construct the project. And so this is a quick list of all the funders, the top three being the primary uh, funding agencies for the project. But as you can see, 
every one of, you know, there's nine funding agencies here. Every single one of them has a different program, a different, pro different program objective, a different reporting requirement for those monies to be justified at the end of the project. And so it, it definitely added to the workload um, throughout the project to make sure that all of these grant agency requirements were being met. So now to jump back to the highway relocation project I had mentioned, um, we had the opportunity to work on that project uh, specifically on, that. I mean that cro project crossed several drainages and the highway department built those crossings to facilitate aquatic, aquatic organism passage and this is a photograph of uh, building the stream substrate to go through a new crossing and then build bioengineering stream banks along it and uh, rather than just your tip, you know, back in the day, undersized culvert, uh, real high velocity, these actually have reinforced concrete boxes with stream substrate through them to allow those fish and uh, other aquatic organisms to move through them. But the great thing about this project happening, this happened in the summers of 2015 and I think it spilled into 2016 a little bit, um, was that they installed this specific structure for our restoration project. So the stream had not been restored yet. This project is out there in the middle of nowhere in a hydraulic sense. And you know, the highway engineers were scratching their heads. I'm sure some motorists were scratching their heads. Um, but it all came full circle in summer of 2016 when we built French Gulch. Um, so, to come back to French Gulch, we had the funding for final design and implementation. And we took our preliminary design and basically just advanced it with input from that multidisciplinary team. And also utilizing a, a, a higher level of analysis, this being particularly two-dimensional modeling. And that was really valuable. Uh, we, we already pretty much had our um, stream channel dimensions, layout, floodplain extents designed. This is our design basically stamped into the um, digital terrain model of the existing ground. But what two-dimensional modeling does, instead of just modeling distinct cross sections, is it models the whole landscape. And so if you particularly look there, and then we cut a cross section to look at what this model tells us, it tells us that flow is going to be out on the floodplain dropping back into the channel in that location. So if I go back, so this flow is actually spilling out of the channel here, flowing across the floodplain and dropping back in there. And what that helped us determine was, all right, in these meander bends particularly, we need to maybe emphasize our micro topography, our stability with woody material and planting so that we don't have a nick point erosion process start here because this, all restoration projects are inherently most vulnerable in the first couple years before vegetation gets established. So in that first runoff year when you know, there's a lot of raw earth still, a lot of young plants without that root mass, if a nick point erosion starts and, and head cuts right through that meander bend, we could circumvent the stream, that would be a steeper slope and could ripple effect up through our design. So it didn't necessarily change our design, but it, it helped us in the field keep in mind where we want to really look to do certain things. Is that um, like the 10 year flood event? Or this is, I think this is the two years, so this is bank full right about there. And that's what we want. I mean, the current stream, I mean, the two year flood stayed in the channel. And it just stayed there and it was a transport reach. There was zero, zero sediment continuity, deposition and erosion. It was all moving through and it was very little fines. So we want that these, these higher flow rates to expand out into the floodplain. And given time, when there's a robust, you know, sod mats and willows in there, that's fine. And, and it can withstand it. But, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll, you'll see some photos during construction. It doesn't have that when you finish construction. It has a lot of bare earth still. And so it's just waiting for it to, um, you have to have some way to try and hopefully prevent that erosion process from happening during that vulnerable time window. Um, and also it, it uh, helped us kind of look at these backwater areas that, you know, right in here actually, I guess you can still see it. Um, this is natural terrain and, and at those higher flow rates we could you know, maybe preserve this area if there's good riparian vegetation there, knowing that it's going to get wet at those higher flow periods and attenuate that, um, those high flows. So just a zoomed out view of that terrain model with our um, design 
channel and floodplain stamped into it. We also simulated our spoils pile area. There was a lot of excavation in most of these reaches, so we could utilize that material to build uh, basically plugs to prevent the restored stream from capturing its old alignment, which is this linear feature here, and circumventing a restored reach. And then taking that analysis and terrain modeling and putting it on design sheets. This is just a clip um, from, I, I should have brought the, the bid package, but you, know, you end up with a booklet that big with a bunch of design specifications and drawings and details that take this project that was in Jim's mind and our mind when we discuss it with him, that we did the field work on, put it on paper, and then give it to a contractor to, to build it. And so, so that's what um, that process looked like. Again, uh, you know, that plan showing areas where we're going to plug the abandoned channel, build new floodplain. Uh, the purple lines are bioengineered banks where we're building those encapsulated soil lifts and coir fabrics and things like that. Um, all for the contractor to quantify and, and to tell them how much it'll cost. Um, because that's really where the, the cost, where the rubber meets the road. And then also showing where I mentioned, you know, there were certain areas where we needed to rebuild the channel, rebuild the floodplain, move a road, do bioengineering. There were other areas where all we really needed to do was pull these remnant mine dredge piles back away from a channel that was in pretty good shape and, and leave the channel as it, as it was, as it currently existed. And so also specifying, you know, through notes and details in this area, don't t preserve the channel but enhance the floodplain. So, so all of those aspects came, um, came together during final design and permitting. And then uh, along that same train of thought, uh, there were some areas where we really didn't want a heavy civil contractor going into it. It was uh, a place where a lighter touch was appropriate. So that's where um, MCC, Montana Conservation <coughs> Corps, got hired uh, with FWP and Big Hole Watershed to put in these um, kind of log pool structures that Jim Olson seen some good results from on uh, trout spawning and, and stuff like that. So these are just a couple of photos of, of the work they did more or less during the same time frame as we were doing construction in 2016. And so in uh, early July 2016, we broke ground, uh, started at the Reach 1 of French Gulch, uh, brought in the heavy equipment and survey and, and staked everything out with cut fill information for the, for the contractor. Uh, Montana civil contractor, like I mentioned, out of Belgrade was the prime. I had a couple subs for some of the bioengineering and revegetation. And really it started out with a lot of earth moving, a lot of willow transplants, that might have been the first one. Um, a lot of shallow groundwater was present. Another thing with these restoration projects that often comes into play is scheduling. We can't build the project in the winter up there, obviously. It's just not feasible. And from a vegetation aspect, building it when those plants are dormant would be ideal, but it's just not feasible to do it up there. So we were kind of forced into a summer-fall construction window. So that meant, while it's not ideal to be re, uh, transplanting willows in the summer during their active growing season, the site was pretty conducive to that with the shallow groundwater and keeping those plants wet and at to best we could, you know, following best practices. So uh, we've seen pretty decent success on, on the willow transplant, um, but we also utilized uh, containerized plantings and willow staking that were able to be implemented throughout the project uh, during a more advantageous time frame. Um, so just more photographs of the, of the floodplain construction and willow transplants happening. A lot of uh, bioengineering, coir fabric, uh, encapsulated soil lifts. Um, so they would build the floodplain, uh, move a lot of that material. There'd be articulated trucks running constantly. And then they'd have sometimes this large excavator, but more often the mini excavator would come in and, and they had a particular guy who kind of got good at building channel, building those dimensions, building that complexity, the bioengineering. And so they, they kind of had um, specified crews doing those and kind of got in a groove throughout the summer and fall. And so this is a photograph from uh, the new highway. There's the crossing that MDT put in and there's the new channel being built. 
I don't even think this has been activated. This is uh, just groundwater influenced flow. Uh, another thing to point out, we started at the bottom intentionally because as we constructed it up, we built in off stream kind of detention basins so that we did as much work off stream, off channel as we could, but eventually we we're going to have to tie that new stream into the existing stream and work in the water, in flowing water, and that was going to generate an increase in fine sediments. And our way to mitigate that as best we could was to start at the bottom, work upstream, and when that new channel got activated, a lot of that first flush flow, which is typically has the highest concentration of those fines, were diverted into these off-stream detention areas and then um, could flow back into the channel once they've deposited as much as we could get out of them. Uh, so there was some phasing and planning on, on that aspect. This is a photograph of Reach One again. Uh, this has been activated, so this is after we tied it into the existing channel. And, and so now this, you know, in this photograph, this is French Creek. Um, this is the spoils pile that was in that digital terrain model to prevent it from capturing its old channel. Another photograph uh, of, a, I think this is Reach Two, and this was an existing pond feature that was off channel that we connected the new stream into and then out of. Again, it, it functioned somewhat as a fines, suspended fines, detention basin, and, and also uh, Jim thought it'd be a, a, just a nice aquatic feature in the future. Then it may evolve into something different. Um, everything here is, is really intended to set the stage for natural processes and deformability. If we come back in 10, 20 years and it's hard to even glean that it was constructed, that's really a win. That's, that's the objective. Um, Another thing to point out, you know, you'll see a lot in here, the, the laser um, level, and, and we utilize that a lot. Uh, that's my dog sleeping on the job. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the things that, that we talked a lot about was how do we stake this project? Because we were hired to construct, you know, to put the information on the ground. That means take a GPS or a total station out there and, and put a piece of lath in the ground that says this, you know, cut this much or offset this much to stream. And, one of the things we came up with was if we tie the restored stream every now and then, I think right there's one of them, into the existing stream, it gives us kind of some hard control checkpoints as we work. I mean, if we build 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet of stream all brand new at, you know, half a percent, one and a half percent, and we're, we're building it in cobble and gravel and small, small boulders at times, that's a pretty hard slope to maintain on its own for that long and then have to tie into a new stream pretty tight. And if you you know find out when you're 100 feet away, you're high or too low, or it, it's a hard thing to correct over that distance. So by having those hard checks every two, three, 400 feet, it made it a lot easier to incrementally uh, monitor our progress and that we were building the stream appropriately. And so that's what we were doing here was checking grade on a stream. Um, well, we've already connected this section, but that's what we utilize that for is as, you know, we could calculate slope and, and all right, are we on grade with our stream channel bottom and floodplain elevations to where we're going to tie in shortly and, and monitor that more closely. And so this is another photo of um, that same pond area once the planters had come through. I'm standing on a, a, a section of dredge pile that we did not take out. We didn't need to to facilitate the floodplain and I'm a good 10, 15 feet above this, and this whole area was at the same elevation before us. So that kind of gives you a context of how much material got moved. And this photograph right here was um, the very upstream end of the project was a perched culvert that we removed and replaced with these boulder controlled steps. This was a, diff, a, a different valley type, much narrower, much steeper stream. Um, and this was really focused on allowing um, aquatic connectivity to the upper reaches of French Gulch that we weren't working in, but can facilitate in the future. Yes. A, a question uh, as you're rebuilding this. So a lot of this stuff is pretty big rubble cobbles, and, and and you talk about the stream. You want it to be able to sort of evolve on its own, but is that material so large that the stream can't move it? Is, is there finer gravels in there? So that's a great question. Um, the dredge piles, yes, they were almost entirely cobble and, and small boulder. Uh, so they were, I mean, you would have to use a, 
an, or there would have to be an extremely large flow event to have enough energy to move those. We found that most of the floodplain underneath the dredge piles was more of an alluvium uh, mobile type mixture, gravels, uh, some cobbles, but you can see, you know, cobbles like that. But a lot of good find it, because that was a concern of ours was um, would there be enough fines content in there? So I don't think I have it anywhere in here, but uh, part of the project, you know, I, I really only show the design drawings, but of the, you know, spec and design booklet, you know, that much is design drawings, that much is specifications, and the specifications had a gradation for the stream bed material, and we looked at that as they were building it, and the native material luckily turned out to mostly be suitable. But where it wasn't, we brought in fines and dispersed those in that material so that we can try and replicate. And then in the future, you know, the intent is that the influx and outflux of those fines and native materials is more in balance and equilibrium. So you have an, uh, kind of a continuity um, that'll, that'll get generated. Matt, where did you do the oversized material? Moved it to a stockpile. <laughs> um, that, uh, I don't think I have any photographs of that either, but uh, that large kind of peninsula that was in my digital terrain model, there's a large area now that is, it, we kind of slashed it, but there's, a, there's big spoils piles out there now that are in upland areas outside of the influence of the riparian zone. And so uh, this is, a, that was a great lead into this question. So this is Moose Creek, and in Moose Creek we found, found that there was a lot of clay lenses, a lot of really loamy material, not a lot of granular stream alluvium. So we actually over excavated three or four feet in a lot of places and laid in a layer of stream alluvium for that stream to, to, to be stable on until new alluvium can come in and be generated and be uh, deposited in the stream channel. And, it, it, and it's not something that we found on French Gulch. So it was just a, one of those site-specific, we did all this work on French Gulch, moved to Moose Creek, and had to slightly re adjust our process and, and adhere to the specification that really hadn't been applicable until then. Um, there was a question. Oh, yes. Um, with all the excavation that you're doing um, and the possibility of mining contaminants, uh, is any of that material hot back there? I mean, Uh, the short answer I can give you is no. That was Pioneer's role in the inceptual phases was to, to do a bunch of testing um, on what the native materials had in it as far as content. And so they didn't find anything, so there was uh, really no like capping of repositories or anything like that. Um, and the material coming down in is assumed to be similar um, as far as the, the sediment equilibrium and processes. Um, since so that that's so so this project did not address any of those um, contaminant type issues that are that are found on other projects, but we luckily didn't have to deal with it here. And this is a photograph of uh, Moose Creek as well, where we're not doing any channel work, but we are extending that floodplain out um, and bring it reconnected to the channel that exists or did exist. And so at the end of 2016. We, yeah, these are just some numbers from the project. Uh, eight acres of new floodplain and wetlands, 30,000 plus yards of mine tailings removed and, and placed in those upland areas. Uh, about a mile and a half of stream in those various sections. The one fish passage barrier, lots of container plantings and the um, watershed consulting uh, had a very motivated crew for willow staking. And so that was the final cost, just under 700000 for um, the initial phase of construction. And uh, it, it went pretty smooth. This is a photograph just below the, the restored reach and some beaver activity. So at the end of 2016, project was completed. Um, the construction contract was, was completed and, and done. Uh, we needed to move into monitoring for the, all those grant agencies that gave us all the money to build it. So we developed a sampling and analysis plan, uh, more or less following DEQ's protocols uh, in conjunction with Fish, Wildlife and Parks and Big Hole Watershed Committee. And one of the things they wanted us to look at 
um, was, and this ties back into DEQ's reporting requirements, was an estimate of sediment reduction in tons per year. We did not have actual measurements in the stream for sediment transport, um, so one of the thoughts that came out of several discussions was what flow rate would it take to actually passively restore the stream to a similar state that we built, uh, say 200 years, and how much material would that move? Our design quantity was 15,000 and uh, 18, 1,800 for Moose Creek. How much tons is in a cubic yard of material? And that gives us tons per year. So a pretty, um, pretty rough estimate, I would say, at best, of, of a sediment reduction. But this was just something they wanted to have some number to speak to and, and describe the process of how they arrived at it. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention that because there's a more analytical um, measurement site-specific based method that I'll touch on here when we get uh, into the next few slides. So in this past summer 2017, we did monitoring for geomorphic response, green line surveys on vegetation, and uh, flow rate monitoring on, well flow rate monitoring was really just at one location, but the yellow reaches are where we did those other um, monitoring data collection efforts in the summer. And the blue lines are the actual as-built channel that we mapped with our GPS equipment. And this is where we relocated that road outside the floodplain. And we basically monitored the entire reach of restored Moose Creek. Oh, wrong way. So we did survey of long profile and cross sections. We measured substrate and like I mentioned, green line surveys. This is the sediment load reduction that we did, so we correlated particle mobility to sediment loading and pre and post. Um, so since the pre-existing channel had been very incised and no access to floodplain, those high flow events had a ton of energy, uh, deeper channel, more velocity, versus now it can spread out through the channel, so lower um, shear stress is the main parameter in that calculation. and so. Correlating that to mobile particle size, and, and that mobile particle size is being reduced, so thereby the sediment transport capacity is being reduced, and so that's where we came up with a different estimate of uh, reduction in tons per year for DEQ using that. And then this is another uh, graph of basically all the metrics we uh, monitored in 2017, and of note, radius, meander length, belt width. Um, pool to pool spacing somewhat, those are all things that we could build. I mean, we built a new channel, we built a new floodplain. Um, things like the substrate, those are more things where we're looking for a trend, those are process based, how those fines uh, migrating and, and becoming more in equilibrium with upstream reaches, uh, flood prone width of course as well as um, something we built. Percent pools, another um, process based metric that, that we're really looking at trends. Um, and so the, the blue is what was there before we built the project, the red is our design parameter, and then the green is what we've measured in the various reaches. So you can kind of see there's a variability. It's not like a one size fits all. There was definitely variability in the construction and in the design. Um, so just a quick, so, so we are actively watching um, how the project is performing. And then flow rate data. Uh, we've got a, a const continuous flow rate monitor down there near the highway crossing of French Gulch and looking at, I think our bankful estimate I believe was about 15 or 14 CFS. So um, in 2017 we had some periods above that um, and visually it, it looked to us like things were holding up, no, no real issues were identified where uh, the stream had migrated a large amount or, or had head cut through something that we weren't expecting. Um, I'm not quite sure that must have been a, I think that was the high snow melt or rain on snow. But, but we'll continue to monitor and see how that hydrograph gets affected in the future. And Big Hole Watershed just got a grant, well I'll touch on that in a minute, but more continuous flow monitoring in both impaired and restored reaches is going to glean a lot of useful information on these projects and how to design them and their effect. And then from that monitoring, we identified there was some leftover money. Um, the, the construction bids came in pretty favorable and, and was on schedule, on budget, 
when we were done. So there's some funding where we could do some enhancements this past fall, and those were mainly centered on just expanding that riparian zone, enhancing the floodplain and, and microtopography. And so we came up with some details for um, more willows, more complexity in woody habitat in the floodplain, no channel work. Um, we even did some road uh, BMP work on French Creek Road. And so this is where a, a local contractor, R&S Johnson out of Anaconda, was able to give us a favorable price and go out there and, and do that work in, I think it was right around Thanksgiving, just before the, the real winter hit. So um, that was great to be able to, to put that money to good use on the project and just enhance the benefits that were already starting to be realized. So now, you know, taking the look from the rearview mirror on what we did and looking forward, um, we've really been trying to think what this project means and what we can utilize moving forward and what we can enhance in our process and designs. And so, um, how to improve our restoration design and effectiveness, how to justify it, um, what are efficient ways to quantify and monitor benefits, and do those correlate between projects and, and watersheds. And the, the permitting of these is, is often uh, an interesting dynamic with uh, permit agencies that um, aren't always permitting projects that are actually trying to benefit the re resource they manage. Um, and some of the thoughts and, and things we've discussed and are continuing to evaluate is that two-dimensional modeling I described, annual hydrographs, um, groundwater, surface water connections. There's been some observations on other restoration projects of increased base flow later in the year from restoration projects, attenuating those high flow events. Um, you know, that's a message if there's more clean cold water or just more water in watersheds, that message resonates with a lot of folks, agricultural folks, municipalities, um, of course the, the natural resources folks. Um, sediment particle size and grad gradation sampling is going to, you know, continue to be, uh, you know, one of those things that it's it's just great to have that data, but you don't always have it, and how can we get it more efficiently? Um, learning from the contractors, how did, how, what could we have done to communicate our message and our design to them and make it more constructible and efficient for them to build? Um, land use impacts, this is an actively grazed area on a rotation with a local rancher, so working with him on I think they rebuilt some fencing and, and changed his grazing rotation to take pressure <coughs> off it for a couple years. 200 head of cattle in a restored reach. I'm not super psyched about that idea, but you know, working with them early in the process really helped and, and um, it's just one of those things that we need to consider. And then, um, as I've mentioned, Jim Olson is, is really integral in this process and his monitoring of fish and macroinvertebrate response and time frame for those responses will be um, really important to consider on future projects and, and, and you know looking at this project. So in Mount Hagen, they are looking at some restoration in French Creek. So this is downstream of our project, um, closer to where the new highway crosses French Creek on a new bridge. Uh, our the French Gulch is roughly right in there. So this is an area that has been impacted by what looks to be some remnant mine and or um, log flume impacts as well as the highway when it was in there. And it's, these banks have been identified. There's a, a pretty stark difference in material substrate in the stream, upstream and downstream of these hill slope sources. And so they're proposing to move that stream off of these high eroding terraces and you can see this is that linear feature that folks aren't exactly sure if that's an old log flume or mining track or something. And, and this highway's actually been moved now, I think. That's an old, yeah, abandoned Highway 569. And then above our project, that photograph, that original photograph um, for the early 1900s, um, there's a potential to do some restoration there, uh, not only for the channel function, but also there's a barrier right in there too um, to fish upstream passage and there's some good good habitat up there um, that, that Jim thinks would be productive if, if fish could get there. And this is just a question about that. Is, is there a major issue though for the cultural resources in Frenchtown? I mean I'm sure some people look at those placer uh, piles at, you know as historic resources. Uh, there, there could be. We haven't gotten to that point to discuss in detail with them. Um, 
but that that's definitely going to have to be a consideration when we look at this project and if it has legs going forward and and this area in particular Jim calls it the Chinese wall but this is French Creek through French town that's you know I mean I don't know how that it's incredible that they built it and it's still standing but it it goes for several hundred yards like this and uh, and this in particular I think I've heard Jim say might be you know a sore spot if we were to say to remove it you know so it, I, it, we'll find out but um, but there is a, a, a an aquatic organism passage connection project that might be able to balance that you know get you know maybe not totally restore something like this leave this in place but get that connectivity through there um, and it, like I said it's just we'll see where that one goes and then just in general uh, this is from the, from the Big Hole Watershed Restoration Plan. This is Mount Hagen, and as you can see, there's a, a pretty, a nice cluster of 303 impaired streams right there that, that are um, being worked on actively. So that's, that's Big Hole Watershed's ultimate goal, is to see this map and these blue lines go away and have this area be restored to a point that it can be delisted. And uh, just one other thing, this project did receive an award for the uh, for the environmental category from the American Council of Engineering Companies of Montana this past year. So it was a, a great to see recognition um, for Jim and, and Jen Downing and Pedro Marquez at Big Hole Watershed. And, uh, and a, a colleague of mine, Russ Anderson, was a, a huge part of this project throughout. And if you're interested in um, more videos or photographs, both of these websites on our website and Big Hole Watershed have some great drone footage and pre-project, post-project comparisons. Um, and I'd like to say thanks for listening and um, take any questions, I guess. So.